Earlier in today's lecture, I said that proprioception is not only knowing up and down, but it's also balance. It's knowing where the body parts are when you're moving. When a ballet dancer leaps across a stage and lands in an arabesque, he's not only perfectly balanced, he's acutely aware of the position of every part of his body. He knows how far his leg is stretched behind him. I'm not going to show you that here. How high his hand is and what is the angle of his torso. It's no surprise, though, that we regard plants as stationary beings. They're sessile organisms, eternally rooted and incapable of locomotion. But as we saw in some of the time-lapse movies, when we look at them patiently over a long period of time, their stationary stature gives way to an intricately choreographed festival of movement, much like Baryshnikov springing to life in the first scene of a ballet. Leaves curl and unfold, stems move and twist, and flowers open and close. Just take a look at this movie of sunflower seedlings. We see these seedlings turning in circles. This is called circumnutation. It's a term that was coined by, again, none other than Darwin. A large part of the power of movement in plants, Darwin talks about plants moving in circles. What he would do would be stay up for hours and with a glass plate above a plant, mark on the plate the position of the tip of the shoot. And he noticed that plants would move in spirals and in circles. Here's actually a picture of one of his uh, traces from his book. He did this with numerous plants, and when he saw that each plant had its own characteristic shape of circumnutation, its own period, and its own speed. But every plant tested circumnutated. This led to two different hypotheses about why plants circumnutate. Darwin said in the 1880s that circumnutation is hardwired into the behavior of all plants. Almost 100 years later, though, there was an alternative hypothesis by two Swedish scientists, Israelson and Johnson, and they claimed that circumnutation is just a result of gravitropism. In other words, the spiral movement of the plant is a result of plant growth overshooting where it should be. You might remember the first movie that we showed, showing that early plant gravitropism, the plant went like this, and then like this, and then like this. What Johnson said was that as a plant somehow bends, is falling a bit to the left, for example, gravitropism would then make it bend upwards. But it then overshoots and then goes a bit to the right. Now the amyloplast would fall again to the bottom. It would be responding to negative gravitropism, try to go up, overshoot, and then go a bit to the left, and back and forth, where you would get a waving movement, which would be going in spirals. So what they were saying is that circummutation is not hardwired, but is only a result of gravitropism. So how can these two hypotheses be tested? How can we differentiate between them? We could differentiate between them using two tools. The first would be genetics. Can we find mutants that are um, defective in circummutation or test mutants that are defective in gravitropism for circummutation? What it actually ends up with is that if you take an Arabidopsis mutant that has no ameloplasts, Arabidopsis mutant that has defective gravitropism also has defective circummutation. We see that actually sometimes in ornamental plants. For example, there's a morning glory that falls, where the shoots fall. It's a hanging plant. The reason that this morning glory falls is that its shoots are defective in gravitropism. And these shoots of morning glory are also defective in circummutation. So the genetics would um, support Johansson's hypothesis that all of the turning is due solely to gravitropism. The other way of testing this hypothesis would be in space. And it was tested in 2007, interestingly, in an experiment that was designed by the same Johansson. His hypothesis as a young scientist in 1968 was finally tested in 2007 when he was a very senior scientist. So aboard the, space the International Space Station, they took seeds that were germinated in space. 
In other words, that these seedlings had never been exposed to gravity, and then tested using a camera whether there was any circummutation. And what they found was that there were very, very minute movements of these seedlings in space, almost undetectable, but there were small circular movements in the absence of gravity. Then when the scientists aboard the space station took these same seedlings and put them in the centrifuge, then the movements got much larger. So on the one hand, Darwin was correct. Circummutation appears to be an inherent feature of all plants. Where was Johansson um, correct? He was correct in that gravitropism then mediates the period or increases how fast and how far it's going. So a plant can be pulled in many directions, as we've seen. Sunlight coming from the side can pull it to bend towards the sun, whereas gravitropism at the same time would be causing it to go up. We saw with the cuscuta plant that a smell might be causing it to go to the side, but at the same time, its amyloplast would be falling to the bottom, causing it to grow up. These often conflicting signals enable to a plant to situate itself in a position that's optimal for its environment. The tendrils of a vine, the part of a vine that circles a fence, search for the fence may be attracted to the shade of the neighboring fence, while gravity will enable it to rapid twirly, will, will enable to circle rapidly and twirl around the fence. A plant on a windowsill will be pulled by light to grow to one side toward the sunny part, while the force of gravity will influence it to grow up at the same time. Just like in Newtonian physics, a position of any part of the plant can be described at one time as a sum of all of the vectors that act upon the plant to tell it both where it is and what direction to grow. And a plant without proprioception would be unable to find its optimal place in its environment for continued growth. Thanks for being with me with this, uh, with this lecture. We'll meet again next week.